welcome to the Quantum Nanophysics Lab here at the University of Vienna. So let me briefly introduce our team and research goals to you. So we're currently roughly 15 people, always changing a bit. Um, master students, PhD students, um, postdocs, myself, um, interns. And we're currently working together on what we call universal metawave interferometry. So by this we mean that we're trying to prepare, demonstrate, utilize the wave particle duality of complex things. Complex things like this fullerene molecule which is composed of 60 atoms and nevertheless can be brought into quantum states like being here at the same time a superposition of position states. So this has been something that we've been doing for quite a while and in the meantime we've generalized this to complex things like these molecules. Well, that's a bunch of different molecules, actually. And our most recent efforts uh, really made that we could see quantum superposition states of molecules that are not only composed of a few dozen atoms like here, but uh, that really actually composed, are composed of up to 2,000 atoms. And we're working on even bigger systems. Why are we interested in this? Um, this has philosophical, technological, and interdisciplinary, other interdisciplinary aspects. Um, the philosophical aspect is, so what is reality? How can it be that these things can be seemingly in two places at once? There's always a way of speaking, but the wave function is delocalized. So that is a philosophical question. How can that be, and why are we so normal? Why don't we do this? Where's the transition between quantum mechanics and our classical observations? The other aspect is, that um, the machines that we build for these kind of philosophical questions, they are super sensitive force sensors, and therefore we can measure tiny accelerations in the presence of electrical optical magnetic fields and use that to learn something about the inner structure of these molecules. So complex molecules, for instance, um, have various internal properties. They can vibrate, they can rotate, they can change their conformation and structure, and all these things somehow influence these, this, this quantum behavior. And we can learn about the internal molecular properties by looking at our matter wave experiments. So there's an interface between uh, yeah, the foundations of physics, kind of philosophy, um, and physical chemistry, as well as uh, biomolecular physics. OK, now let's meet the team and see what they're doing in the lab and what kind of technologies we're developing there. What we have here is probably the most visual of the quantum experiments our group has to show and essentially an upgraded version of the high school double slit diffraction experiment. In our case, we use a diffraction grating, so an area of slits, instead of just uh, two of them. And we diffract organic molecules such as dye molecules or antibiotics. To do that, to get our molecules to diffract, we evaporate them with a tightly focused laser from a thin surface. And since we have a small laser focus, this allows the beam to develop a large enough coherence to explore large spatial regions of the grating and to get a strong enough interference signal. The molecular interference pattern is then gathered on a glass plate and can be imaged by fluorescence microscopy. The setup was first used in 1999 to show the first demonstration of the wave nature of massive molecules that was done in fullerenes. Nowadays, we use it for a large range of molecules and mostly to develop coherent beam splitting techniques, either still with material gratings or with different types of optical gratings, either absorption or phase gratings, SIG diffraction gratings showing the first demonstration of Bragg diffraction for organic molecules 
or in the next steps for photoionization or photoisomerization gratings, again, for small organic molecules. Well, you've seen the double slit experiment, which is one of the most elementary demonstrations of the quantum superposition principle. Massive objects are, however, usually associated with very short de Broglie wavelengths, and that is very hard to resolve in multi slit experiments. Now we will show you how to reveal the wave particle duality of massive molecules in near field interferometry. If you want to interfere very massive particles and highly polarizable particles, uh, tablet law interferometry is your concept of choice. Um, it is uh, mathematically a bit more involved and slightly less intuitive than the far field, uh, but the basic principle is this. We have three gratings of equal periods, spaced equidistantly. You illuminate the first grating principally coherently, uh, the first grating restricts the phase function spatially, which as a consequence of the Eisenberg uncertainty principle leads to a momentum uncertainty that leads to a spread out of the wave function, which then covers two or multiple periods of the second grating. The multiple possible paths taken then leads to inter interference further downstream that lead to an, the molecular density pattern distribution that we can visualize and resolve by scanning the third grating transversely across it. One unique feature of this uh, apparatus is that we use both uh, nanofabricated material gratings in the first and the third position and uh, an optical phase grating at the center position. And since the interaction between the phase grating and uh, the particles is off resonant, this uh, concept is quite universal. It works both for atoms, for organic molecules, and even for, for metal clusters. Um, the machine is highly sensitive to uh, small shifts, even on the nanometer level, and that makes it ideally suited to resolve uh, tiny forces and also measure uh, particle properties, molecular properties. The Lumi experiment relies on the same trick that uh, Stefan already explained, this KDTLI, Kapitzer-Dirac-Talbot-Lau interferometry. And here we essentially take it to the extreme where we stretch everything by a factor of 10 and have one meter separation between the gratings. And this allows us to work with de Broglie wavelengths as small as 35 femtometers. Uh, of course, this long baseline comes with challenges, so we have to um, take care with vibrations and have a, a sophisticated vibrational isolation system. We have to take care about the Earth's rotation. Uh, the relative alignment of the gratings is also very important. So we have 18 nanomotors on the inside where we can position and tilt the gratings with about nanometer resolution. Now what's nice about Lumi is that compared to most other interferometers, we can work with really a wide range of particles. So from atoms to molecules to nanoparticles. And this is quite nice for measurements on complex molecules uh, because then we can reference the atomic standards, which are typically more precise. Um, in the central grading here, we have an optical phase grading, as in the KDTLI scheme. This is a class 4 laser with a high coherence length, uh, with a very well-defined period, because the periods need to match between the nanomechanical and the phase gratings to within about a diameter of a hydrogen atom. Now, in this experiment, we've actually shown interference of the biggest thing to date. Uh, it's a tailored organic molecule of about 2,000 atoms, weighing 25,000 atomic mass units. And this is actually a nice sign of the collaboration that we have with chemists. Uh, we worked with uh, the group of Marcel Meyer in the University of Basel to synthesize these molecules. And these experiments allowed us to directly rule out modifications to quantum mechanics, which would predict some sort of breakdown uh, of the theory at a certain mass or complexity regime. Taylor molecules in Lumi interferometry represent the current world mass record in metawave interferometry. The mass of about 25,000 to 28,000 atomic mass units is already comparable to that of the green fluorescent protein, GFP. But can we prepare similar quantum states of genuine native biopolymers? Let's see how this is done using Otima interferometry. So this is the Otima experiment. Otima stands for Optical Time Domain Ionizing Metawave Interferometry. And as in KDTLI and Lumi, Otima is a near-field interferometer that uses three gratings to prepare, manipulate, and probe molecular coherence. But here we work with cutting-edge laser technology. The gratings in Otima are standing light waves made from 157 nanometer light with a high enough photon energy to ionize a large variety of biomolecules and nanoparticles. And since the gratings in Otima are pulsed, Otima is a time domain interferometer, which means it is not the position of the gratings that have to be precisely defined, but the time of their appearance. Currently we are interested in biomolecules, and just recently we managed to show quantum interference of a biologically relevant molecule, an antibiotic, 
the polypeptide gramicidin, which is a polymer made from 15 amino acids. And to produce stable and intense molecular beams of such fragile biomolecular systems, it is key to use femtosecond laser desorption techniques. So we basically focus a femtosecond laser on the sample surface, desorb the molecules, pick them up with the supersonically expanding noble gas jet, cool the molecules and transfer them into the interferometer chamber where the quantum experiments are performed. The source techniques that we develop in our group produce stable and intense molecular beams of even heavier and more fragile biomolecular systems. Together with the interferometer concepts that we develop, uh, this approach will hopefully soon allow us to perform single molecule, single photon recoil spectroscopy. To explore the wave-particle duality of even more massive objects, cluster interferometry is a very promising and scalable avenue. The FWF-funded project MUSCLE on multi-scale cluster interference paves the way towards new quantum experiments with metal clusters. And Sebastian will tell you more about it. You have already seen um, the many variants of uh, metal wave interferometry and an upgraded version of LUMI will combine the best of all our previous experiments and push metal wave physics to even higher masses. Again, we aim for universality and this time we are going for metal clusters. Metal clusters can be generated in aggregation sources and the resulting clusters can then be cooled, um, guided and mass selected as ions. Additionally, they can be neutralized and ionized by UV laser light, which can also be used as a metal wave beam splitting mechanism. The idea is to combine the concept of LUMI interferometry with free optical gratings similar to those realized in Ottima. But instead of pulse gratings, we aim to use continuous high power 266 nanometer laser beams. We hope this will carry us to experiments well beyond the 100,000 Dalton range. Okay, so all the experiments that you've seen um, need careful preparation and analysis, and uh, for that we have our theory group, and in this case this is Philip. So Philip, what are you doing? Oh, uh, yeah, so we're the, the theory subgroup, and where our main task is to create new interferometer concepts, which try to go, like we try to jump ahead, I don't know, five, ten years into the future, and figure out what do we need to, to break new records. So we, we make conceptual designs of new interferometers, we simulate them, and we analyze the data sometimes from, from running experiments. So here we have a simulation of a new type of beam splitter for massive molecules based on Bragg diffraction. And we simulate its efficiency and dependence on the illumination parameters. So we split a, a beam of molecules. Here in the experiment, it's going to be antibiotic cyprofloxacine and it shows the splitting of the beam into the original beam and the diffracted beam which could be later used for interferometry. So but when you say you're splitting the beam, what, what does that really mean? Why is that different from sorting little billiard balls? Yes, because each of the billiard balls, the, the molecules in this case, is simultaneously sent to the left and to the right. And when you recombine them, you can see an interference effect become between the diffracted beam and the original beam. The question is, why is it challenging at all to see the wave particle duality of big things? And uh, well, what are the potential models that would predict any deviation from standard quantum mechanics, so to say? Well, it's, it's, it's challenging for a number of reasons. One is, is the problem that everyone in the quantum, or the challenge that everyone in the quantum community has to overcome is the coupling of, of the systems to the environment because they have to be really isolated from the environment to show any quantum behavior. That's, that's why we need low pressures and uh, an ultra clean environment. What is also challenging for us is for those really big objects to show their quantum behavior, we really need to apply a strong, strong momentum kick, strong momentum transfer, and we need to wait to see the effects of that. And for, for bigger and bigger particles, that means more time and, and stronger kicks. And, and in the long term, yeah, we, we try to find the barrier between the strange, unintuitive quantum world and the familiar classical world, kind of approaching it from the bottom. So starting from what we know is quantum and pushing the, the limits from towards higher and higher particles, towards higher and higher masses. And yeah, in the future, like 
once we're there at the interface, uh, we might see if the quantum superpositions break down or, or if they potentially stretch up all the way to the macroscopic world, uh, which would be a very exciting thing to find out. Probing quantum physics at the interface to the classical world is an intriguing and truly challenging goal. And how can we generalize metawave experiments to particles as massive as 1 to 10 million protons? Let's have a look into the lab, where we're working on optical tools to prepare, cool and detect silicon nanoparticles. Cooling of nanoparticles can be achieved in different control laser systems. And our team has already achieved the cooling of these nanoparticles by Sisyphus cavity cooling in a controlled way. So in this experiment, we are aiming for nanospheres and nanorods with a mass on the order of 1 million to 10 million atomic mass units. We think that quantum experiments with widely delocalized matter waves should be in reach. One could use such particles for novel tests of quantum mechanics, for example, continuous spontaneous localization and the search for dark matter. When working with those particles, one also has to optimize the coupling between matter and light. And one way to achieve that is to shrink down the mode volume of the cavities being used. In collaboration with the group of Michael Trubke, we are working with some of the smallest highly reflective cavities on the planet. A key challenge in the quantum community has been the loading of nanoparticles in uh, optical cavities and tweezers in a controlled way in high vacuum. Our team has already successfully demonstrated the use of laser-induced acoustic desorption to uh, launch very well-controlled silicon nanoparticles. And uh, we are now currently exploring the, the use of femtosecond laser as an equally viable printing tool for launching uh, the nanoparticles in a very controlled way with high repetition rate and in uh, better cooling schemes. What we look at here now is a different approach using uh, femtosecond nanoprinting techniques, which is basically uh, shooting a very short laser pulse focused to a few hundred nanometers and melting out a tiny droplet out of our target substrate. And then uh, this uh, droplet is ejected from the substrate and forms a perfect sphere. In the end, they usually look something like this, so a really nice few hundred nanometer diameter sphere. Compared to other nanoparticle sources, our femtosecond printing approach allows us to have a fine control over the nanoparticles being produced. And for that we can even paint our university logo on a micrometer scale, where you see each single dot being a nanoparticle launch site.